Uh, wish you good afternoon, yeah. folks. Thank you for joining us for our second um, webinar approach to our annual uh, summer lunch and learn series. My name is Paul Anderson. I'm the executive director at the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. Um, uh, hopefully, I know some of you. Some of you, you don't. You can't see me. I'm I'm working virtually today, but attending the the webinar just like you are. Um, many of you know that MCCF's mission is to help secure the future for fisheries in Maine and the communities that depend on them. And a lot of that is a part, part of our work is collaborative research, collaborative management, and collaborative education. Um, and our education, of course, is try to help all of us understand the issues as well as we can. So our webinar series uh, is monthly uh, in the summertime, and we pick a fisheries issue that is particularly important at, at the time. And so today's uh, uh, conversation is about the halibut fishery. And um, I'm, I'm glad you could join us for this. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna let Carla introduce Bill and, uh, and then we'll be able to moderate a Q and A between him and hopefully Steve Rosen, who's um, a fisherman out of Vinyl Haven that, that will hopefully be with us today. I'll just tell you that these are monthly and so the next one will be July 31st and features Dr. Libby Jewett, who is, uh, works for NOAA and is a director of the Ocean Acidification Program. Um, but she's not going to talk about ocean acidification. Libby is, uh, she resides part-time in Stonington and she spent a month up here this past year talking about, about the issues related to right whales. So she'll be summarizing her findings and insights from the industry. So that's next month. Look out for that. We hope you can join us then. Uh, but thanks again for joining us now, and I'll, I'll let Carla introduce our speaker. Uh, before uh, before Carla introduces Bill, I um, uh, just uh, want to take care of a couple of housekeeping details here. Um, if uh, at any time during the presentation you uh, have a question, I'd like you to uh, hit the raise hand button, um, and we'll get to your questions at the end. But I'd like to um, uh, call on raised hands at the end so that I can turn your audio on. Um, if you don't have a microphone or if you don't have that function, uh, you can use the uh, chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're on your phone, it may, be, it may look a little bit different, um, but either tap on the, the Q&A button or the chat and you can type a question in and I'll be monitoring both of those. So go ahead, Carla. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, <clears throat> Carla Gunther, I'm the Chief Scientist here at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, and I am happy to introduce Bill DeVoe, uh, guest speaker today. We tend to pull in a few guest speakers in each season of our Lunch and Learn series, and we thought it would be timely to address halibut and some pretty cool new halibut tagging that is happening out of DMR. Uh, Bill has been working at DMR out of the Booth Bay office since 2016. He works with, uh, he's a data guy. He works with geographic information systems, lots of mapping. He's also working on developing the electronic reporting program at DMR. And he recently took over as the, uh, the halibut scientist and um, has been working with two fishermen along the coast uh, to tag with these new tags we're gonna learn about in this talk today. And he's working with those two fishermen, one of whom, Steve Rosen, is from Vinyl Haven. He'll be joining us for, for the talk, but then also for the Q&A. So, thanks. Take it away, Bill. Sounds good, thank you, Carla. Uh, yeah, so we'll get started here. Uh, see if I can work this. So yeah, on the menu, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about some basic halibut biology, uh, the fishery, get into the management uh, aspects of the fishery a little bit, uh, talk about some research questions, uh, specifically looking at tagging studies with some findings so far. So uh, to start off with, uh, we call this talk uh, No Place Like It, uh, using place as the general term for a flatfish, uh, not specifically for an American place as the term is usually uh, used for. Uh, so to start off we'll, with, uh, we'll look at some uh, Atlantic halibut superlatives. Uh, the Atlantic halibut is very likely the largest uh, flatfish in the world. Uh, this sort of depends on who you ask. If you ask somebody on the west coast, they'll say that the Pacifics are bigger. 
Uh, but that's probably because at present there are more large uh, Pacific albit than there are Atlantic ones. Uh, but the large, largest uh, ever believed to have been caught is probably around 700 pounds caught off Cape Ann. The, uh, the actual official world record was caught in Norway uh, and it was uh, just over 500 pounds. Uh, they're probably the longest lived uh, of any of the Atlantic flatfishes. Uh, Otoliths, uh, ear bones have shown that they can live up to 50 years uh, or more. Uh, the eggs are the second largest of any Atlantic flatfish, uh, between three and four millimeters. Uh, the turret, also known as the Greenland halibut, is a little bit larger. So uh, this is a pretty pretty good size uh, Atlantic halibut here. Uh, not sure the actual specs on that fish, but just to uh, to give an idea of you know, maybe how big a 700 pound fish looks like. This is a Pacific halibut that was caught in 2014 in Alaska, and it weighs 482 pounds. So kind of look at that fish and try to, try to visualize how much a, you know, a 500 or even a 700 pound fish, uh, how big that would actually be. It's pretty amazing. Uh, there's a basic map here showing the uh, distribution of the Atlantic halibut across the North uh, Atlantic. Uh, there's fisheries uh, in Iceland, Norway, uh, Greenland, uh, as well as Canada and, uh, and the, uh, the Northeastern United States. So uh, getting into some basic biology, uh, the, the Atlantic halibut is a right-eyed Flatfish. Uh, I tend to find when talking about fish ID that di uh, drawings are oftentimes more helpful than photos. Uh, so there's some other uh, right eyed platfish uh, that we have within the Gulf of Maine and elsewhere here. Uh, the closest related species to the Atlantic halibut is uh, undoubtedly the Pacific halibut, uh, which uh, occurs on the west coast all the way up to Alaska. It's the only other species in the same genus, uh, the Hippoglossus genus. Uh, still, they're a little bit different. Uh, the Pacific species are a little bit slower growing. They have some difference in the secondary scales. Uh, Atlantic halibut are like uh, humans. They have an XY chromosomal system. So uh, just like humans, the male is XY and the female is XX. Uh, the Pacific uh, halibut have different sex chromosomes altogether. Uh, they have a ZW system. So this is a really good indication that they're separate species. Uh, in the 20th century, there was actually some debate about whether there was a difference between uh, the Pacific and Atlantic strain. Uh, some other species that are not necessarily related genetically, uh, but are sort of related in how they look uh, and also occur in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, the Greenland halibut, also known as the turbot, uh, is right here. They don't, they tend not to get nearly as large uh, as Atlantic, I'm trying to get the laser point around here, it's bouncing around. <laughs> uh, the turbot doesn't uh, get nearly as large. Uh, it tends to uh, inhabit deeper waters. I'm thinking the only time that I've ever encountered a turbot in the Gulf of Maine has been on multi-species trips out in the Jordan Basin in the really deep water. Uh, and they typically weren't much larger than about two feet. Uh, uh, next to that is the American place. Uh, the American place is, I suppose, somewhat similar to the Atlantic halibut in that uh, it has a large mouth. It's considerably smaller. It also lacks the concave uh, caudal fin that the uh, turbot as well as the halibut have. Uh, and the last species uh, that's sort of similar in that it's a right-eyed flounder is the black bat, uh, also known as a winter flounder. Uh, again, doesn't get nearly the size of the turbot or the uh, halibut, uh, however, uh, blackbacks are probably the only other bright-eyed flatfish that tends to be as meaty. Uh, when you see a blackback, they're quite thick. I'll talk a little bit about the diet. Uh, we have a collection of photos that have been submitted to the Department of Actual Halibut Stomach Contents. Uh, back in the 50s, uh, the classic uh, text, Fishes of the Gulf of Maine, by uh, Henry Bigelow uh, reported that you know, the, the, diet, the diet of the halibut in any particular locality depends chiefly on what other ground fish are most easily available. 
Uh, and you know, what this basically indicates is that they pretty much eat anything. Uh, very opportunistic feeders, uh, which probably accounts for the large size uh, that, they, that they grow to. Uh, the larval stage feed mostly on copepods. Uh, the adults pretty much eat anything that they can get in their mouth. I uh, tend to be a sit and wait predator lying on the bottom uh, to ambush prey. Uh, various studies have found all sorts of strange things uh, in the stomachs. Uh, seabirds, chunks of iron, chunks of wood, sea ice. These photos here uh, from top to bottom, uh, we have an American shad, a uh, chunk of an Atlantic salmon. I think this third one is uh, a plastic bottle that somebody sent in. Uh, it's very common to find uh, uh, various crab species as well as lobsters in the stomach. Uh, that's shown in this last, uh, this last photo here. We, uh, we also have indications uh, that alewives might be a pretty big part of the diet, uh, which makes sense, uh, particularly with the movement of alewives in the spring, uh, in addition to how they moving inshore. I'll talk a little bit about, about these sort of habitats uh, where we find the fish. Uh, the sort of traditional knowledge is that they're found on sand, gravel, or clay, but not on soft mud or rock. Uh, there is a general rule that larger fish are in deeper water. Uh, we have not seen that in the harvester reports sent into the department, but that's probably because the state fishery doesn't go out into deeper water off the continental shelf, so we wouldn't be aware of that. Uh, if it was happening. Uh, again, the sort of traditional knowledge is that uh, it's very rare for an halibut to be uh, outside of the three to eight uh, degrees Celsius temperature range, uh, which is about 36 to 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, however, since we've started deploying electronic tags that record the temperature, uh, we've seen, as shown on this plot here, that they do go quite a bit outside that range. Uh, and that's good news for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, we've all heard about the Gulf of Maine getting warmer, so it's nice to know that the fish seem like they can uh, be okay with some warmer waters. Uh, this plot was made in 2019 as we've gotten more tags back. Uh, I can tell you that we've seen even higher temperatures that the fish have encountered. Uh, this is a diagram. Uh, this was actually for Pacific halibut, but it's probably very similar for the Atlantic. This sort of shows the life cycle uh, in terms of how they move uh, from deeper waters uh, in, in shore. So it's thought that the mature uh, fish spawn in deep waters off the continental shelf. Uh, these numbers here are meters, but it's not really relevant for the purposes of this conversation. Uh, after, uh, after spawning, the eggs uh, drift, they turn into these uh, pelagic uh, larval stage that slowly drifts in shore in the currents and eventually settles near the shore and then as the, as the uh, fish grow up, they tend to move further offshore until they eventually go back out off of the continental shelf to spawn. Uh, maturity and spawning, I started to mention that. The uh, males mature at a smaller size and younger age. Uh, usually uh, about 50% of the males are mature around six years of age. 80 centimeters in length. Uh, the females mature a little over a year later, around 7.3 years, uh, and 103 centimeters in length, which is about 41 inches. Uh, spawning is thought to occur between November and March at greater depths than occupied during the remainder of the year. Uh, that said, we're not really sure where Gulf of Maine halibut spawn, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, previous studies off of Canada and Alaska uh, have, record, have recorded spawning rises, and they've typically been between 800 and 1,000 meters uh, deep, uh, which if you're familiar with the uh, oceanographic, oceanography of the Gulf of Maine, uh, there's no water that deep anywhere within the Gulf of Maine. So in order to spawn, the fish would have to go over the continental shelf. Uh, as I mentioned uh, a few slides back, the eggs are the second largest of the Atlantic flatfish. Uh, they're neutrally buoyant at a salinity that occurs around those depths, uh, which makes sense that if the fish are uh, you know, extruding eggs into the water for a thousand meters down, if they're neutrally buoyant, they'll tend to drift in shore and not sink to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, it's also thought that larger fish produce more eggs. 
uh, that you know a female halibut at the first spawning is probably producing you know 100,000 to 200,000 eggs. There are some indications that they can produce up to 4 million eggs at larger sizes. Uh, after the eggs hatch, uh, that they drift. Uh, they hatch after about 13 to 20 days. Uh, then the larval stage drifts for a very long time for uh, any fish, uh, anywhere between six to 12 months. We're not not really sure. Uh, they drift in the midwater depths. They rise uh, into the shallows, pushed ashore by currents. They eventually settle in the shallows. Uh, again, we don't really know a lot about the larval stage. Uh, all indications are that the larval stage is incredibly rare in the wild. Uh, there was a paper in 2013 out of Norway that indicated that it's possible only 57 uh, larval stage hal Atlantic halibut have been caught in the wild. Uh, most of what we know comes from aquaculture, uh, particularly in Norway. There's a pretty good industry where they do tank reared uh, Atlantic halibut, and that's provided most of the information that we know about the development in the larval stages. Uh, this little diagram here sort of shows the larval development. Typically by the time they're about four centimeters in length is when they settle to the bottom and lay on their, depending on how you look at it, they lay on their side. Uh, so as, a, as a, the larval stage is swimming upright, you know, kind of like what you would think of as a normal fish. Uh, and then while the larva is developing, this, uh, this eye that is on the other side and the early stage is migrates to the sort of top right side of the head and then once the larval larvae settles uh, they lie on their side in the bottom like a normal halibut would. So in terms of where the nursery grounds are for uh, the larval stage, uh, previous studies have identified that uh, southern Nova Scotia as a nursery ground. It's thought that the halibut spawn on the Grand Bank. The larval stage is carried by the Labrador current down across the Scotian shelf, and that the little baby fish are probably settling around here and starting to grow up. Uh, as we'll look at in a minute, the, the main New Hampshire trawl survey run by DMR has caught a uh, very young halibut off the coast of Maine in sand and gravel habitat. So this leads us to this question, uh, where are the fish in Maine coming from? Are they spawned off the Scotian Shelf, the Grand Banks, or further south somewhere on George's Bank, uh, the Gulf of Maine Shelf? Uh, so as I mentioned, observations of halibut larvae in the wild are rare. Uh, most of what we know about them comes from aquaculture. Um, what about young uh, young fish age zero to one. Uh, so it, on this map here, you can see this is uh, fish uh, caught by the trawl survey less than 26 centimeters in length. Uh, that number 26 centimeters comes from some data uh, from Julia Beattie's 2014 master's thesis that reported that halibut at age one were about 24 centimeters for males and about 25 uh, for females. So using that general number of 26 centimeters, uh, we can see that there actually have been quite a few uh, young halibut caught by the trawl survey off the coast. Uh, specifically, since 2000, there's been 278 caught. Uh, there is a general trend that more are caught in the spring and that they tend to be larger. So it could be that what we're seeing is that the larvae are hatching late winter somewhere off the continental shelf, uh, drifting for six to nine months, and probably hitting the eastern Maine coastal current as they come around the tip of Nova Scotia and then being distributed along the coast. And then by the following spring, uh, right about the time that they would be age one, uh, they're getting toward that 20 to 25 centimeter length that they're actually able to be captured in trawl nets. Uh, the sort of take home from this though is that it's unlikely that, you know, an age zero or age one halibut uh, would be migrating to the coast of Maine. Uh, I think this is a pretty good indication that settlement happens along the coast that uh, you know they're not they're not coming from elsewhere. Uh, there's also uh, been a couple of conversations uh, with with fishermen uh, that you know young five to ten inch halibut have been found in lobster traps. Uh, so again it seems like you know they they are growing up here. 
Uh, so on that note, getting into the fishery uh, without getting into too much of the specifics of management, uh, species was abundant, historically severely reduced in the late 1800s due to overfishing. Uh, you can see this is sort of the classic long time series graph that you know we show in these presentations. Uh, as you can see, the landings uh, in the late 1800s, they actually had to clip the scale of, of the graph because the landings were so high in the 1890s. Uh, and then ever since then, landings have kind of gone down until they've pretty much reached the low point around 2000. Uh, but then in the last 10 years, we've seen landings go up. Uh, this is uh, sort, of, sort of classic, uh, you know, Northeast Hollywood painting by Winslow Homer. Uh, I think this, I saw this at the Portland Museum of Art about 10 years ago. I'm not sure where it lives now, but uh, sort of depicts the traditional 19th century fishery, uh, which was conducted using schooners and uh, long lines with uh, sort of bank stories to go haul the end of the line and uh, take the fish out. Uh, as I said, there's a state fishery as well as a federal fishery. Uh, the state fishery is managed by DMR, goes out to three nautical miles from shore. Uh, after that, uh, the species is managed uh, by the federal government, by the National Marine Fisheries Service and the New England uh, Fishery Management Council. Uh, both fisheries have a size limit of 41 inches. I started to talk about a few, few slides ago about uh, the point in which uh, the fish reaches maturity. Uh, that 41 inch size limit is because at 41 inches you can expect that a female halibut has a 50% chance of being mature and having a chance to reproduce. Uh, years ago, I think 10 year, 10, 12 years ago, the size limit was lower. It was 30 or 31 inches and we lifted that up. Uh, as mentioned on this uh, graph and we'll look at a few others, uh, there are recent increases uh, in both the catch and indices, but they're still depleted on a historical time scale. Uh, there's no maximum size limit in either fishery, uh, which is interesting because there are some indications that larger fish produce more eggs. So having, so, you know, we think of the lobster fishery where there is a maximum size limit because there is this big population in deeper water that is producing lots of eggs. Uh, you know, maybe someday that'll be something worth uh, considering that maybe there should be a maximum size limit if the larger fish are producing, you know, the most eggs. Uh, oh, the slide got cut off. Ah. Well, this was supposed to say gear at the top <laughs> and to talk about what kind of gear is used on halibut fishing. Uh, so for the state fishery, uh, it's exclusively uh, Lawn lines, and I suppose rod and reel if you wanted to. Uh, typically caught on line, lawn line gear called tub trawls. Uh, you can see some photos here of uh, tub trawls. It's uh, basically a ground line with a series of hooks that are baited. Uh, on either end of the line is uh, an anchor and then a rope going up to a buoy. So the line is hauled and after soaking for a set amount of time and the fish are taken off. Uh, currently, uh, for the main state fishery, it's only size 14 and 16 hooks, which uh, to give you an idea of the size of that, that's about an inch and a half to two inches across. Uh, for the federal fishery, halibut are also caught in uh, bottom trawls and gill nets. Uh, the federal fishery makes up uh, more of the catch overall, but is limited to one fish per day, whereas the state fishery has 25 fish per season at present. Uh, so taking a look at landings for Maine specifically. Uh, so this is a time series of halibut landing since 1950. Uh, and so you can kind of see this in the, the, the plot a few slides ago. Uh, but you know, 2000 was kind of the you know, lowest that landings have been probably ever in Maine. Uh, and then recently we've had this spike. Up. Uh, landings rose up until 2010, uh, which I think was when the change went from uh, 50 fish to 25 fish per day or something like that. Uh, but then even, even with that uh, more restrictive management for the state fishery, we've still seen uh, landings increase uh, up to a peak in 2016, 2017, but then sort of going down the last few years. Uh, so we're at the point now that we're, we're catching roughly the same weight of fish as in the 1950s, although the reporting may not have been as good back then.
Uh, the number of harvesters has actually decreased over the last few years. Uh, so, you know, 20, uh, 2018 to 2019, the total value of the fishery was about $300,000. Uh, it was twice that in 2017, but we also had more than twice the harvesters. What's also interesting is if you look at the, uh, the value uh, adjusted into 2020 dollars, uh, 2017 was the highest uh, value year for the fishery since 1950. And the reason for this is that the price has been better. Uh, this is, is the, the inflation adjusted price since 1950. Uh, so you can see that over the, we've gone down a little bit, uh, particularly this year, which isn't in here yet. Uh, but within the last uh, decade, the actual price for Maine holiday has been the best that it has been since the, as long as we really have records. So yeah, the state fishery uh, traditionally has been in May and June. Uh, the season has been cut down by several weeks over the last uh, decade, sort of incrementally. Uh, there's indications that it's always been a spring fishery in Maine. Uh, there was really no regulations in state waters before 2002. Uh, halibut fishing in Maine uh, would frequently occurs alongside lobstering as secondary income. There's the practice of uh, you know tying um, a couple of hooks onto a lobster trap. Uh, the reason why it's been a spring summer fishery traditionally is is probably due to availability of fresh bait. Uh, you know, alewives, mackerel, and herring are all available in abundance in the spring, uh, both as bait and uh, in the wild as food for for the fish. Uh, and so that probably explains why there's just more halibut around in the spring. Uh, we've had various effort reductions uh, in, in 2018, uh, without getting too into the weeds of uh, management, you know, structures and decisions. Uh, the season was cut down to reduce uh, effort and try to reduce catch. Uh, it was reduced again in uh, this past uh, season, uh, and that was to avoid triggering account accountability measures, uh, because basically uh, the state waters component of the uh, total allowable catch, <clears throat> uh, if it's exceeded, it triggers accountability measures, which would basically mean that, that anybody with any federal permit holder, including in lobster would have zero possession for halibut for the following year. And so that's a situation that we've been trying to avoid. Uh, there's some statistics up top here, uh, sort of about uh, for the state fishery for the last few years, about total active harvesters, total number of fish landed. Uh, and just a couple of things to point out uh, in this, uh, that uh, the state fishery for halibut is still uh, an open fishery. Anybody can receive an endorsement. Uh, and there are many more endorsements issued in Maine than harvesters that actually go fishing. Uh, in fact, if, if everybody who had an, an endorsement uh, to participate in the state halibut fishery landed just one fish, we would be over the state annual catch limit. Uh, luckily, it's a pretty small percentage of people that actually have endorsements that go fishing. Uh, most landings uh, are one to four fish per harvester per day. Uh, and on average, most harvesters catch about five fish per season. Uh, like I said, there's a limit of uh, 25 fish per season, uh, and there's very few uh, harvesters that get, that get to that level. This just sort of shows a visual. Uh, this plot is basically showing uh, that, you know, the area of this is uh, the total number of fish landed in 2018, uh, and then, this is showing by category uh, for each fish, whether it was the only fish landed that day by that harvester or whether it was landed in a group of two fish. Uh, my point in showing this is uh, just to show that it's, uh, it's relatively unusual for more than uh, five halibut to be landed by a single harvester in a single day. Uh, most, of, most of the landings are less than five fish per day. Uh, so something else, you know, to, to think about uh, as far as characterizing this fishery with this, uh, you know, is if you're limited to 25 fish uh, per season for the state fishery, and there's a mean weight per fish of 46 pounds, you can sort of do a back of the envelope estimate for, you know, how much an individual harvester can stand to make uh, in this fishery. And uh, 
you know, my point in mentioning this is that, you know, this is something that occurs as secondary income, uh, primarily for Maine lobstermen. Uh, this is not a fishery that somebody relies on for, you know, 100% of their, uh, of their annual fishing income. Uh, so we've seen some recent uh, upticks in some of the abundance indices for halibut. Uh, this is from uh, Paul Rago in 2017. This is uh, indices from our trawl survey. Uh, we've sort of seen a peak in the indices around 2010, which corresponds with a peak in uh, landings. Uh, some of them have gone down a little bit since. Uh, we have limited surveys really to build these indices. Uh, you know, using a trawl survey uh, to do abundance indices is, is difficult because of gear selectivity. Uh, halibut are not easy to catch in a trawl necessarily, as particularly the larger ones can oftentimes escape. Uh, the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries has a sentinel survey in eastern Maine that's been using jig and long line gear, which is one of the few uh, surveys uh, within Maine that's actually capturing any information about, uh, about the, the uh, stock status. So meanwhile in Canada, <laughs> uh, these are uh, some indices from the Canadian Long Line Survey, uh, as well as our trawl survey, uh, both of which have shown upticks in recent years. Uh, just to give a you know, rough idea of, of how different the fishery is in Canada, uh, the total allowable catch in Canada for this fishing year is 4,789 metric tons. Uh, the, uh, Total uh, annual catch limit for the United States right now is 100 metric tons. So there's a, what is that, a 400 or 47 fold uh, increase in the, in the amount of uh, fish available in Canada compared to the US. Uh, the Canadian fishery also has a smaller limit uh, on size limit. Uh, their size limit is about 32 inches. Uh, and the Canadian fishery is also year round. Uh, although we get most of our tag returns at DMR uh, in the fall. So why the difference? Why is this fishery just so much larger uh, in you know, Canadian waters off Nova Scotia and Newfoundland? Uh, there's a couple of indications. Uh, there's been some discussion that it might be linked to the crash of cod stocks in Canada. Uh, you know, big difference uh, between cod and halibut is the lack of the swim bladder. Uh, it's thought that halibut are a lot better at surviving on hooks after being dragged up from the deep than other ground fish like cod. Uh, and that low release mortality has uh, helped them do better than other ground fish like cod in Canadian waters. Uh, this other study, uh, Shackle in 2016, uh, concluded that the local U.S. stock is depleted and that basically the United States is a sink for Canada that the halibut that are in the Gulf of Maine uh, tend to cross a line into Canada and probably not go back. And basically what we're seeing around here is just sort of the edge of the, uh, the Canadian stock. So, you know, think, thinking about the sort of the conservation status or sustainability uh, of, of halibut, both in terms of the entire, you know, geographic range, uh, but then also locally within Maine. So, you know, if, if, you, if you Google, you know, sustainability Atlantic holiday, you'll find all sorts of things from places like the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, Greenpeace, you know, and they all seem to indicate that the Atlantic holiday is, is in danger. Uh, in fact, the Greenpeace website actually stated uh, that there was no directed fishery for holiday in the United States. And when I read that, I thought, well, I know several people that would, uh, I think, disagree with that pretty strongly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that being said, it says, uh, you know, although populations are well below target levels, U.S. wild caught Atlantic halibut is still a smart seafood choice because it is sustainably managed under a rebuilding plan that allows limited harvest by U.S. fishermen. Uh, and it's also important to note that this is mostly a hook and line fishery with low bycatch and minimal habitat disturbance. So I think, you know, looking at this big picture, there are probably certainly 
uh, areas of the geographic range that have been somewhat depleted. Uh, but within Maine, we still have an active and very lucrative fishery uh, that produces a high quality product that is delicious to eat. Uh, so, you know, why question that? Uh, getting into some of the research done at uh, DMR. Uh, there's been a number of projects over the last 20 years. Uh, in 2000 to 2004, there was an experimental uh, federal fishery that eventually led to uh, the current federal fishery that's limited to one fish per day. Uh, in 2007 to 2008, there was an experimental uh, long line fishery uh, that was funded by the Northeast Cooperative Research Partners Program as a fisheries independent long line survey. Uh, from 2000 onward, we've had mandatory harvester log books. So anybody, anybody uh, participating in the state fishery has had to fill out uh, log books daily, uh, reporting both catch and bycatch. Uh, one of our biggest research efforts at DMR has been uh, tagging, both conventional tagging and electronic tagging, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then also since 2017, we've done some limited amounts of sea sampling, uh, sending observers from the departments uh, uh, during the state season on holiday fishing uh, trips. We did not uh, do any sea sampling this year because of COVID-19. So yeah, pretty much uh, the rest of my talk is going to focus on uh, tagging, since that's a pretty big part of the research program at DMR and has probably led to some of the most interesting uh, results. Uh, so yeah, as mentioned, around, uh, around 2000 to 2002, the department uh, started working with fishermen to uh, put uh, conventional uh, spaghetti tags uh, on halibut. Uh, these were these yellow, uh, yellow plastic coated wire tags. They were threaded into the second opercular plate of the fish. Uh, this tagging effort has been 90% or probably more uh, has been done by uh, fishermen on a volunteer basis. Uh, the department held training meetings, passed out tags and materials, uh, and then at the end of uh, the season, the uh, individual fishermen would send in uh, paper logs of the fish that they, that they tagged. Uh, this is ongoing. Uh, you know, we still have quite a few fishermen that are actively tagging all of it as they release them. Uh, in the case of these spaghetti tags, uh, we provided small rewards for the returns. Uh, typically, we send out one of these coffee mugs. Uh, we had some stickers in past years. Uh, there's been over 3,000 fish have been tagged with these spaghetti tags since 2000. Uh, and as of last week, we have, have 433 returns. I haven't updated my slide yet. So the interesting thing to note uh, with this tagging program is that uh, about half of all of the wire tags that have been returned to the department uh, were caught in Canadian waters. So this map shows uh, all of the recapture locations for the conventional wire tags. And some of the questions that have come up as a result of this. Uh, so the first thing that's really obvious looking at this map is that we've had returns from a long ways away from Maine. Uh, there have been all that caught in the Grand Banks uh, that we've had tag returns for. Uh, as well as the Gulf of St. Lawrence, like right off the coast of Newfoundland, and then just a ton of returns off the Scotian Shelf in southern Nova Scotia. Uh, so over the years, we've, this has led us to ask uh, uh, some different questions. Uh, and also to ask if we can answer those questions with conventional wire tags or if we need something a little bit, uh, a little bit more complicated. So again, looking at, uh, at all these tags, uh, you know, when you look at the map, the first thing that jumps out is the long distances covered by some fish. But when you actually look at all the returns that we've gotten, uh, most of them are very close, are caught very close close to where they were released. Uh, particularly the, the median uh, travel distance for the conventional tags is only 38 kilometers. Uh, but this doesn't always indicate that the halibut was caught. Uh, this doesn't always indicate that 
that the fish didn't go anywhere while it was at large. Uh, you know, just because most of our tags get caught off of the coast of Maine, it uh, doesn't mean that those fish couldn't have gone up to the Scotian Shelf, out to the Continental Shelf, or any other distance uh, while they were at large or at liberty. Uh, we tried to look at seasonal effects in the past uh, on tag returns, and this is just sort of a good visual. Uh, the total distance traveled uh, is almost always less uh, by fish caught in May and June. And that has nothing to do with seasonal movements of all of it. That has everything to do with when our state fishery is. Uh, it makes complete sense that the best chance for a fish that has been tagged off Maine to be caught would be during the directed state fishery during May and June. So uh, over, the, over the years, starting in 2007, uh, various electronic tags, the uh, couple of different tag types were used. Uh, DSTs, which are data storage tags, uh, and pop-up satellite tags. Uh, the big difference is data storage tags store the temperature and depth uh, at a set interval uh, while the fish is, is moving. Uh, pop-up satellite tags also record depth and temperature, but at a, after a certain number of days, the tag releases, shoots up to the surface, and uh, uh, sends a signal to a satellite uh, with a limited amount of the data. Uh, if, you, if you're able to retrieve the tag from a research vessel, even better, you can get all of the data off of it. Uh, so the, the big difference is uh, public satellite tags tend to be very expensive. They're around $4,000 a piece, whereas data storage tags are about $300 a piece. Uh, that being said, uh, for in, in order to get a data storage tag back, somebody has to catch the fish. Whereas a pop-up satellite tag, you know, you can say after, you know, six months release, and you'll at the very least get the location that that tag released at. So the top image here is an externally attached data storage tag, and the bottom uh, image is an externally attached pop-up satellite tag. So uh, between 2007 and 2009, uh, the department as well as some other partners uh, tested both of these types of electronic tags, and what we found was that uh, basically that uh, pop-up satellite tags were really expensive and they had a very high failure rate. Uh, that sometimes, you know, only 10% of them would actually release. Uh, that said, uh, we did get about a, we did we did get a dozen uh, both data storage and pop-up satellite tags back that were released between. I mean, uh, in 2007 and 2008. Uh, and the big thing that was discovered with these 12 tags is that none of them went into deeper water. Uh, none of them went over the continental shelf or even any of the deeper basins within the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and so this led to a paper being published in 2016 uh, that the title of the paper was Continental Shelf Residency by Adult Atlantic Hollowit Electronically Tagged in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and the conclusion was that uh, these fish that were tagged must be separate from the Canadian stocks because the Canadian stocks were known to spawn in deeper water and none of these fish went anywhere into deeper water. So the assumption, I suppose, was that uh, they were resident on the shelf along the Gulf uh, Coast of Maine. So in 2017, uh, my predecessor, Mike Kersela, got curious uh, about whether longer range migrations of halibut could be examined using data storage tags. Uh, so in 2017, uh, uh, he procured 19 of these star OD data storage tags and in a little bit different uh, tactic than what was employed in the past, the tags were surgically implanted into the fish. Uh, so an incision was made into the abdominal cavity, the tag was pushed through uh, and then stitched up with a couple of sutures. Uh, the first uh, year, 2017, uh, we released 19 uh, fish tagged with these data storage tags. Uh, got a couple of returns back that fall and winter, which was a really good indication the fish were surviving the surgeries. Uh, a high reward was offered. Uh, as I said, you know, you have to have the tag back to do anything with the data. Uh, so we offer a $300 reward as well as fish info, uh, a map of where the fish went for uh, anybody who returns um, 
a data storage tag out of, out of a hall that they got. <clears throat> so the following year, uh, another 54 fish were released. And this time uh, we used tags that had more memory uh, because it was those first batch of fish that were released, uh, the tags probably could have gone about two or three years and were only recorded about every 15 minutes. Uh, and there were indications by other studies in Canada and in Alaska uh, that you could capture spawning rises in all of it using these data storage tags. Uh, so the company uh, Star Odie started making a tag with uh, some more memory available. And uh, Mike uh, Kersler got some of those and released 54 more uh, cap, uh, running at a faster rate. Uh, so currently we set the tags up uh, during the, uh, what we suspect is the spawning season, uh, November to May, the tags run at a faster rate, uh, recording depth every two minutes to try to capture spawning rises. Uh, these, these spawning rises, as I mentioned, have been captured in Pacific halibut as well as Atlantic halibut on the Scotian shelf. Uh, the spawning rises typically are about, about 50 to 100 meters uh, high off the bottom uh, at depths of 800 to 1,000 meters. So uh, with, with these new tags that, uh, that we released the last few years and that we'll be releasing more of this year, they have about a three-year recording time at this interval. Uh, additionally, uh, we can reuse the tags. The batteries go out to about a decade. So given that a lot of these tags come back to us within about a year, uh, it's not inconceivable that the same tag might go in three or more fish before the battery runs out. This is just showing how the surgery actually goes. the video during the uh, presentation but I guess not. Yeah it's, it's pretty choppy. Uh, these are just also some other photos showing. I yeah I figured that was a, that was hit or miss yeah. <laughs> if anybody really wants to see it I can send it around after. <laughs> yeah I, I'm gonna give you a two minute warning Bill okay. Two minute warning? Yeah. Uh, yep so these are just some pictures showing uh, how we do the surgeries. Uh, again uh, uh, orange wire tag in the second opercular plate. Uh, we've released 126 data storage tags so far since 2017, 50 to 60 more this July. Uh, this is just a quick visual of what the spawning rises look like uh, when they've been recorded uh, in other areas. It's pretty apparent. You see this rapid rise in depth over a couple of minutes. So uh, when we get these tags back, uh, data storage tags, uh, so this project was working with uh, the Nature Conservancy as well as the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, and some of the scientists there developed a geolocation model. So you take that depth and temperature uh, and plot it against a, an oceanographic model of uh, known depth and, uh, and temperatures across the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and this produces an a estimate of where the fish went uh, within an error of about six and a half kilometers, which out in the middle of the ocean is pretty good. And so just to sort of show how much uh, more information this gives us than the conventional spaghetti wire tags, uh, this, this halibut was caught a quarter kilometer from where uh, she was released, uh, about 11 months after being released. So using a, tr a traditional spaghetti tag, you know, we would have assumed that the fish just kind of hung out there the whole time that it was at liberty. Uh, but the data storage tag, when we would do the geolocation, actually shows this incredible movement, you know, across a huge chunk of the Gulf of Maine. So when we put this all together, uh, the department, uh, DMR, uh, this doesn't include the data storage tags and pop-up satellite tags that uh, the University of Massachusetts and the Nature Conservancy have uh, gotten back. Uh, this is, uh, these are all the tracks uh, thus far. Uh, and so of the 14 that have been returned, which is about an 11% return rate. 
Uh, the longest that we've ever had one at Liberty was 23 months. Uh, that one was returned to us a few weeks ago. Uh, strong evidence of site fidelity, uh, a tag that I just got back, uh, showed the fish going through the same areas. I basically did a, a loop twice around the coast uh, of Maine. I mean, it went past Monhegan on the same day, the second year that it was uh, at Liberty. Uh, we also have some evidence of a possible spawning ground in the mouth of the Northeast Channel. Uh, three of DMR's tags and one of the Nature Conservancy's tags uh, went into deeper water uh, off the continental shelf. And uh, two of uh, DMR's tags were actually there at the same time. Uh, something interesting to note is uh, this map overlay is a paper chart from a book published in 1929 called Fishing Grounds of the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and it's interesting that this map has the Northeast Peak where it extends out on the Northeast Channel uh, labeled as Halibut Ground. And there's this quote saying how uh, in basically the late fall and early winter that the vessels would go out into the deeper water off the Northeast Peak uh, over the edge of the continental shelf and find large numbers of halibut. So it's possible that this was known about historically. So uh, in conclusion, uh, some of the things we've learned from tagging. Uh, halibut in the Gulf of Maine display diverse migratory patterns. Uh, sometimes they stay close to home, sometimes they take off and go all the way up to the Grand Banks and probably don't come back. Uh, they undertake large changes in depth during movement but remain in a mostly constant temperature range. Uh, combining wire tagging with electronic tagging is ideal. Uh, we can track both long-term movements over many years using regular spaghetti wire tags uh, and see when a fish is caught on the Grand Banks. Uh, and then using electronic tags, uh, we can see more fine scale movement within the Gulf of Maine. Uh, there is a general movement of uh, halibut in the northeasterly direction. Uh, and this lines up with something that's called the uh, migration compensation theory that is pretty much that if, uh, if the fish are spawning off of the Scotian shelf, they're drifting uh, inshore into the Gulf of Maine and growing up when they're adults, they need to go back to that area to spawn so that you know, the life cycle is completed and the fish don't just continue to migrate south. Uh, another, another trend uh, that we've seen uh, in, in this is that there's no evidence that fish tagged in Canadian waters like the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, or the Grand Banks or Scotian Shelf uh, have ever been caught uh, in Maine waters uh, at all. So this leads us to a couple of questions. Uh, is spawning annual, skip spawning, intergenerational? Uh, the, the frequency of spawning as well as where it occurs would have pretty big implications for management uh, in terms of seasonal timings, durations, differences year to year. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, the findings indicate that Maine halibut probably spawn in Canadian waters, uh, whether that's on the Scotian Shelf or in the Northeast Channel. Uh, and that the larvae drift into the Maine, into Maine and settle. Uh, as mentioned, net movement uh, is in a northeasterly direction. Uh, so sort of in summary, in order to assess U.S. halibut meaningfully, uh, cooperation is needed between uh, the U.S., Canada, uh, as well as France with their area in St. Pierre and Miquelon. Uh, some other current research, as I mentioned, uh, PSATs, uh, pop-up satellite tags, and data storage tags are being used by the Nature Conservancy on uh, the University of Massachusetts off the Cape. Uh, the Canadians are also doing some work with pop-up satellite tags in the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Maritimes. Uh, Memorial University has a Northwest Atlantic uh, Holiday Connectivity Group going on right now, just kind of assessing movement throughout the entire uh, Northeast. Uh, uh, Canada DFO is doing some genetic work. Uh, I mentioned the Sentinel Survey in Eastern Maine, uh, and also the Nature Conservancy and NMFS are doing some updated aging and maturities. And I think I'm pretty much out of time. We should probably open it up for question and answer, huh? Thank you, Bill. Um, that was everything you ever wanted to know about halibut, so you could ask more. And so thanks. Uh, and <laughs> Reintroduce uh, Steve Rosen and his son Sam uh, sitting to his left and they're both fishermen out of Vinyl Haven and um, 
active participants in both the state and the federal holiday fishery. So take it away. Um, questions? Hmm? Yeah. We, uh, so uh, uh, for those of you uh, in the audience, uh, if you want to ask a question, go ahead and either raise your hand or use the chat box or the question and answer box and I'll call on you. And well, uh, just to, uh, go ahead. I'm just going to say I, I've been fishing since uh, the early 70s and I've been involved in all the tagging projects. Uh, so that brings up a good point. We should probably mention that uh, Steve has been one of the uh, industry members involved in the electronic tagging specifically. And uh, while we wait on some questions to filter in, uh, uh, maybe you can give a little bit of, um, maybe a little bit longer introduction, Steve, if you want, or, or Sam, or both. Uh, yeah, I'll start off. Um, I started out um, in a skiff just outside the harbor here, and you could catch all of it back then. So I've seen a lot of changes in the industry, and you know, from fixed gear to snap-on gear to circle hooks to, um, you know, huge amounts of people effort going into the fishery. You can almost uh, tell a few months ahead of time whether there's going to be a, a lot of increase in landings because of the type of lobster season it is. If it's a poor season, there's going to be more effort. Like this year, there's been a lot of effort. So there'll be an increase um, in landings, even though there's been a reduction in days. Um, that's it. <laughs> I'm I'm seeing no questions so far, Bill. I think you answered everybody's questions before they had them. So I could ask one. Um, how many other people were tagging this year? I guess I didn't really realize that many people were putting spaghetti tags on. Um, are you still? Are, are those numbers mostly old numbers back from when they tagged a whole bunch in the in the '90s, or are you actually still having other people tagging a bunch now? Um, there's relatively, there's probably only you and a few other guys that are doing it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we, we didn't do the tag meetings this spring, uh, yeah. between COVID, and I also just came into this last fall as well. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just, I mean, I've only sent out a couple of tags mm -hmm. this spring. So, so yeah, most of what we're seeing, I mean, the, the bulk of the, of the spaghetti tagging was probably it probably peaked around like 2013 or 14. Mm -hmm. we uh we never used to have a closed season years ago uh as far as the regulations go but we always traditionally were done by the first of june fishing for all of it because of dogfish and they're no longer an issue so you can catch all of it basically year round now all right mike hang gear permit active in March and I had the best fishing right around March this year and um, was tagging. Um, tagging and releasing oftentimes a dozen fish a day or more. Um, so yeah, there's the, there are quite a few fish still around in the spring, um, whether they're being caught later or not. Hey Bill, we got a couple of questions trickling in for you. Um, Ian Stewart uh, writes, thanks for a great talk. I work for the International Pacific Halibut Commission. There are many parallels between the species. Do you have any current studies on discard mortality rates? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure if we do actually. Uh, you know, we have estimates of discards from the harvester reports, but not sure that anybody in Maine has done any work seeing, you know, are those discards surviving more than an hour or a day? You, I mean, if the fish is treated well, I think that you'd, you'd struggle to kill it. Um, I mean, if you don't gaff it, you take care of it when it comes aboard, I, I think that we would probably say that most, most if not all survive if they don't sw swallow the hook and if you don't gaff it. Um, it's really when, um, I mean, you get 
half a fish or, or cut it or um, bring it aboard hard that you're probably going to have mortality. If, if you don't gaff it, you probably know that it's not going to survive. Um, and really, I mean, it's, uh, I'd say most of the mortalities that you'd see are from, from swallowing it and waiting inside their stomach. Um, yeah. In the early 90s, when we set up the tagging program with Cole Canwick, uh, Steve Kamer from the IPHC came out to uh, give us lessons on how to tag the fish and instructions, and it was very helpful. Um, Chris McGuire from the Nature Conservancy has a uh, follow-up comment. Uh, he says he doesn't know of any uh, U.S. discard mortality studies. Um, so uh, He also has a question uh, for Steve. Uh, what is your perception of the halibut resource abundance over the last five years? Um, I think there's been a reduction. I, I do agree with an earlier comment by Bill about we're on the edge of the Canadian population. I have always thought that. I, I think the, uh, the federal waters feed the inshore waters um, for a decent sized fish. Uh, and a, a couple more questions from Chris. Uh, can you talk about the sizes of fish tagged by spaghetti and DST tags and how those fish sizes may influence the results? We'll talk about that. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And that actually, well, I mean, yeah, Chris, you were on that call the other day uh, with some of, some of our Canadian collaborators. Uh, yeah, you know, the, uh, the, the white tags were done, you know, on a voluntary basis. So, you know, fish that were legal size weren't being tagged. It was it was sub legal discards, uh, or in some cases, you can go ahead, Sam, if you want. If you want to I, mean, I, that. I think I tagged seventy five legal fish this year, and most of them are right around fifty five inches, probably on average. But yeah, for the most part, you're not going to tag big fish unless you're fishing federally with hang gear permit. Everyone else is going to tag undersized fish, so there there really isn't much tagging that's going to take place in the state waters fishery, um, unless yeah. you don't want to keep the fish and you throw it over. Um, I mean, I otherwise, if in, if you're limited to one a day, yeah, you're you're going to tag nice stuff, but otherwise, yeah, it's just going to be undersized. Um, yeah, I think that's that's definitely an exception. The tagging that you were doing, uh, you know, when we look at the the release uh, lengths, they're they're mostly they're mostly uh, sublegal, particularly back when the size limit was lower for the state fishery. Uh, and uh, for the data storage tags, it's the opposite. That in general, uh, if, if that halibut is caught, we want the tag back. And the tag is surgically implanted, so there's no other way to get that tag back except to kill the fish. So because of that, the, uh, the fish that get tagged with the electronic tags uh, tend to be legal sized or almost legal sized uh, so that there's a guarantee that if, if it's caught that the tag will be returned. I, I think last year we tagged 29 fish to the, the days we went um, three days and I think there was one undersized fish out of those 29 yeah. last year. And it's, uh, it, it's worth noting too that uh, since the Canadian fishery has a smaller size limit uh, of, of, what did I say, 32 inches approximately, uh, it's a guarantee that, I mean, even if, a, even if a fish isn't quite our legal limit, if it swims into Canadian waters and gets caught, uh, it'll be a legal fish. I've got a question in the chat box here from Jacob Vandy Sandy. Hi, Jacob. Um, has there been any effort to encourage the Canadians to increase the minimum size of 41 inches to match our regulations? I'm not sure. Uh, I, that's a management question. Uh, if, if Megan Ware is on the line, she might be able to talk about that. Is Megan with us? Uh, Megan's not with us. Maggie's here, though. That is a good you know point. the fishermen would like it. We yeah, asked uh, for it plenty of time. Same thing. There was effort in the early night. Enjoy that. I don't know if the feds have taken that on at all. So I think that's where it would end up being be a federal to a federal conversation. 
Yeah, I don't think that'd be something that we'd be talking about at the state level, although it would certainly benefit the the main state fishery. <clears throat> yeah, I've harassed Megan about that a few times. <laughs> yeah, I know I know within the state of Maine everybody talks about Hall that has heard that. But uh, I think at the federal level they don't quite um, respond to Hall a bit quite urgently. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what's somewhat strange, uh, there, there's been some studies indicating that uh, the more growth days that you have, so in terms of the growth day, you know, being related to temperature and the number of days, uh, that female halibut reach maturity faster with more growth days. Uh, so that's potentially good news for us if the water is getting warmer, that uh, they might be reaching maturity faster and having a better chance of spawning. Uh, but it, that kind of goes against the idea that uh, maybe further north you'd have uh, a lower size limit. Uh, I'm gonna take a couple more questions here and then I think we'll wrap up uh, from Tom Dime over on the other end of the building. He can probably hear me talking. Um, is there, has there been any uh, discussion about studying the potential for either a slotted fishery or closing the channel off the Northeast Peak for spawning? Uh, I don't think there's been any conversation about that. I mean, that's a putative spawning ground is the, how the, the verbiage that was used in the paper published. Uh, we, we have not recorded actual spawning rises. And I mean, it, it's a pretty good indication uh, I'm also, I'm not sure how much fishing goes on out there. Uh, we have seen, I mean, that's Canadian waters uh, for, for starters. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe traditionally that was a place where fishing occurred. Uh, we have had quite a few tag returns from Canadian waters that were right off the continental shelf. So that does, I suppose, indicate that Canadian fishermen do fish in that deeper water. But I think that would be a conversation that wouldn't happen until we had some pretty, uh, you know, solid evidence that spawning was happening. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to wrap us up here. I don't, I don't see any more questions trickling in. So um, thanks a lot for, uh, for being on today. And um, uh, thank you for the talk. We appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, thank you, Steve and Sam, for joining in. Cheers. Awesome. I want to remind folks that are uh, still with us that uh, the upcoming talk is on July 31st and it's called Learning from Lobstermen, Insights into Whale, um, Right Whale Conservation. And uh, that's going to be by uh, Dr. Libby Jewett, uh, who's on our board and also the director of um, the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program. White Whale. Oh, Chris just says, great talk. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> uh, thanks, Chris, for, uh, for all your questions. Um, so uh, to sign us off, you can uh, learn more about Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries by visiting us on the web at coastalfisheries.org. Um, if you have any questions to follow up from this talk, you can always send them to us at info at coastalfisheries.org. Um, and uh, make sure you follow us on social media. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Steve and Sam. Bye. Thanks. See you. Excellent.